Hello and welcome to Euro PCR 2023. I'm Andrew Sharp. I'm a consultant cardiologist and professor of cardiology from Cardiff in the United Kingdom. I'm delighted to be joined by my friend and colleague, Dr. Kathleen Toma uh, from Pittsburgh in the United States, a great expert in pulmonary embolism. And today we're going to talk about the pulmonary embolism sessions that have been occurring at Euro PCR 2023. Kathleen, welcome. Thanks. Thanks for having me. So this is a new session for Euro PCR. Uh, this is, we've had at this conference a 90-minute session where we went through a lot of the detail on pulmonary embolism, how to select cases, the interventional treatment of pulmonary embolism. And this is a new thing uh, that for a lot of people in Europe. But this is something you've been doing in the United States for a while. So why cardiologists? Why, pulmonary embolism is not traditionally a cardiac field in many parts of the world. Why should cardiologists get involved in the treatment of pulmonary embolism? Yeah, so uh, it turns out that not a lot of people claim pulmonary embolism as their sort of field. So it's, it's kind of left out there. And I think once you get into this, it makes total sense. This is an RV failure problem that evolves from subclinical shock to frank shock. And as you know, we as interventional cardiologists have dealt with that in the, in the STEMI field for such a long time. So it comes natural to, to, to treat that and, and be involved in that field. So what has been your experience? How did, how did this evolve for you? Yeah, well, like you, when I started out, I'd always perceived pulmonary embolism to be a problem of hypoxia. But in fact, the cause of death is failure of the right side of the heart. Now, right. I think cardiologists should take an interest when one side of the heart fails. And a lot of the drugs that are involved, a lot of the procedures involved, and the care of these critically ill patients sometimes, it plays well into our skill set, right? I yeah, mean, absolutely. We're talking anticoagulants, thrombolysis, catheter procedures. We're talking vasopressor support and, and perhaps even device support. Yeah. Uh, so I think it's well suited to, to cardiologists. We've had a particular focus at this meeting on interventions. So we've got, we've got three major classes of, of available device in, in Europe, and you've had them for a little bit longer. So tell us a bit about what devices are available for the catheter treatment of pulmonary embolism. Right, so the, um, the, the earlier technology that came, to, uh, to came into our hands first is the, the catheter-directed lysis in the form of the uh, ECOS catheter, which essentially delivers a smaller dose of lytics locally, and that's very important to understand that local delivery of lysis is perhaps more efficient than systemic delivery of lysis at a lesser uh, bleeding risk. The, more, the newer technology are um, aspiration thrombectomy technologies, which are now sort of divided into large bore aspiration thrombectomy, which is the Inari system. This is the one that we have most experience with. It's been around for a while, a number of data behind it. Um, and the penumbra system is the other um, aspiration technology that's smaller bore. Um, it's a little bit behind in terms of data acquisition, but evolving very well. And there is at least 10 other technologies out there that are, that are coming in this field. So there's a lot of enthusiasm in this field. And th some of these are big devices, right? I right. mean, so the, the Inari, the one that you're most familiar with, it goes up as far as 24 French. Absolutely, yeah. So, so again, that's, that, that becomes a little bit intimidating at first. Um, but the reality is that, first of all, in terms of access, the venous system is very forgiven. And we, again, know how to get large bore access now, especially in the Tower, in the tower era. Um, and navigating the pulmonary vasculature, again, for people who are spending time in that space all the time, um, it's, it, it comes naturally. So it's not a, as big of, a, of an issue as is initially thought to be. So people are getting comfortable with this technology now. And the access site, uh, what about the ECOS and the penumbra? What sort of access site sizes are we talking yeah, about? Yeah, so, so uh, penumbra is a smaller um, access site. Interestingly enough, they are evolving from 8 to 12 to 16 now. So they're going towards the, the larger bore. It, it seems that large bore is important to, to be able to cope with this very large amount of clot that you have in the pulmonary arteries, so slightly larger access there. The ECOS catheter doesn't need that much. That the access is only two six French sheets, basically, so it's significantly a uh, smaller problem. So. Okay, so uh, we want to do a pulmonary embolism uh, treatment program. Who are these patients? I mean, we're early on in the evidence generation. We're not, we're not saying that this is a class 1A interventional program. But, who needs these interventions and how do we select these cases? Yeah, so listen, we wouldn't be here if it wasn't a need for this, right? And you're looking at all the data and clearly massive P, even treated with lytics, is a problem. There's bleeding issues, there are patients who are not getting TPA, there's a, a, a whole slur of, of things that, that, um, that prevent these patients from having a good outcome. And it goes into the intermediate risk as well, which are the patients who are not hypotensive yet have markers of subclinical markers of RV dysfunction in the form of RV dilatation and a positive troponin most, of, most often. 
These patients also carry high mortality, and perhaps there is room there to improve on the, on the current treatment, which is essentially simple anticoagulation. Mm. So risk stratification is very important, uh, very important up front. And again, data generation comes with some of these technologies. So, mm. so we're talking massive P. I, I think in Europe we call it high risk P. That's P that's causing shock, hypotension, blood pressure below Frank 90. Shock, yes. These are dying patients. Yes. You know, mortality of 70% if they get no treatment. Right. And the current standard of care is thrombolysis, delivered by the peripheral vein, large doses. But so many patients can't have lysis. So how do you handle those patients in the United States in your program? Yeah, so in the, on the uh, talk that we had today at EuroPCR uh, 2023, we actually emphasized this concept of switching the mindset from why should I give this patient TPA to why don't I take this patient to the cath lab instead? Uh, and we're starting to gather evidence that, you know, clearly we know what's wrong with the TPA. We see that the catheter-based technologies are inkling in the right direction, the, 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 the uh, bleeding is significantly less, the complications are less, it's effective, it works most of the time in terms of reducing the, uh, the um, uh, thrombotic burden. So that's kind of the, the shift that we see. I mean, not everybody is doing this, even at our center, it's not, fully, not everybody adopted this. But it's interesting that it's, it's the physicians around us that are actually asking us to do this, while before it was us promoting the technology. So um, people must see some benefit of, of, of this approach. Mm. And in our final minute, I guess the golden patient to start with is not the dying shocked patient. Right. Uh, you know, tell me about a good patient, how you see them, select them, and what happens to that patient on their journey. Right, so this would be your intermediate high, uh, high intermediate risk uh, patient, which again, it's a patient that has some RV dysfunction, positive troponin, not in frank shock, but sometimes when you, when you pop the hood and you see that the patients are tachycardic, they have elevated lactate, there is subclinical shock. Um, we take these patients to the cath lab. Um, usually you can figure out if they're doing extremely well with heparin very quickly, then we stay put and follow them. But if they, they clearly show signs of not improving or deterioration, we definitely take them to the lab. Um, you have to ensure that you have all the imaging reviewed, and that includes the CT and an echocardiogram. That's very important. Um, we do a, it's, it's right-sided femoral axis, ultrasound guided, fluoro guided. You wanna make sure there's no clot there. Uh, we always do a right heart cath before to understand the hemodynamics because we can manipulate some of these numbers. Uh, and then we have a very sort of uh, well-defined sequence of how do we go about it. We're not spending too much time with the catheters in the heart thinking what to do next. So it's aspiration, start on the right side, move to the left side, and, and go through a set of and steps. And clean it out. Clean it up. So probably about up. an hour of procedure. Right. Well, speaking of time, we're out of time now. So thank you so much. This is the beginning of a journey. We're not saying that this field is mature yet. It's on a journey. We're building data. We're doing randomized trials. And this is an exciting new area where there's significant unmet need. So thank you very much, Dr. Toma, and thank you very much to EuroPCR 2023 for giving us a chance to talk about catheter treatments of pulmonary embolism.